Technology innovation management taught us how important it is to create a new innovation with new technologies that could be related to new product development or new process development, and by doing so, being also aware of the typical challenges related to the introduction of a new innovation and to the production of a new innovation, which is the combination of the S-curve of technology adoption and the S-curve of technology innovation. However, as much as your product can be a successful product in terms of technology content, in terms of standalone value of a technology, still, it's very important to craft the right deployment strategy, the right go-to-market strategy, which can help win market share and set our product, our new innovation as a new standard with the dominant design in the market. Any example about this? Well, a famous example of a company that was able to craft this deployment strategy is Sony. When Sony introduced their PlayStation, they were literally able to address all the main challenges of a deployment strategy. So they combined their technology expertise, the feature of a product with an aggressive marketing strategy, aggressive pricing strategy, and distribution as well. So this is an example in an industry game console, which so many leaders in the industry then being eventually replaced by newcomers. So this is an industry where initially there was <coughs> a, a domination by Nintendo, then was partially replaced by Sega, by, then by uh, Sony, then there was Microsoft coming into the industry. So here we see all the cycles of technology innovation management and adoption from the market. And we can also see how some companies were successful in nailing the deployment strategy to reach out to their potential users. Deployment strategy is exactly a combination of pricing strategy, positioning strategy, marketing strategy, distribution strategy. However, we need to keep in mind the specifics the factors that make innovation management unique, such as the concept of the returning, the, um, a returning effect on our innovation, learning curve, network externalities, so increasing return of our innovation. So this is a typical concept embedded in technology innovation management, which we need to consider when we craft our deployment strategy. As you can see, in the gaming industry, deployment strategy implied that companies that used to be almost in a position of monopoly in the industry were eventually replaced by newcomers that introduced new innovations and that were able to market the innovation in an efficient way and to replace uh, the incumbent. So without further ado, let's now move into the specifics of deployment strategy. Deployment strategy is per se a transdisciplinary part of innovation management because here we are combining almost every management and economic discipline. We're combining concept from finance and accounting, we're combining concept from um, from marketing, concept from sales, concept from strategy, and so on. So we need to keep in mind this holistic approach to deployment strategy. There are also important legal consideration uh, in terms of intellectual property protection as well as uh, contractual agreements with partners, with suppliers, with uh, distributors. Uh, how can we craft in effective deployment strategy. In effective deployment strategy, we consider the timing of entry, we consider the compatibility 
with existing products with installed base. We'll also consider the pricing, the distribution system, and also the marketing, the marketing strategy. We know already that when it comes to the timing of entry, there might be advantages of being a first mover or, or be an early follower or be a late follower, as well as there are disadvantages in being a first mover, early follower and late follower. Of course, we are not going back to this because it's something we analyze in some prior video lectures. But here, what we would like to stress is that some period of time might be strategic to help your deployment. An example can come again from gaming industry as well as electronic devices. Generally, a good moment to launch this will be ahead of the holiday season, Christmas season, where people are more likely to buy these new devices. So if you can combine your new product development, your distribution cycle, your marketing cycle, and so on with the seasonal peak of Christmas, then in this way, you are taking advantage of a more auspicious time to launch your innovation. Well, there are also other consideration uh, to, to make. For example, is related to when you enter with a new generations, what generation your competitors are launching. So for example, if you launch a new generation of a product in a moment when your competitors are still at a prior generation, it could be that the market will not perceive the unique advantage of your new generation. And so if this happens too early, then the market will not appreciate your increased technology standalone value. So this happened, for example, when Xbox was introduced, even though technically it was more advanced than PS2 by Sony. However, since it was during um, it was introduced during the same uh, with a prior generation of PS2, the market didn't really perceive this new innovation. And so we kind of understood that the technology feature of the Xbox were the same of a PS2, even though this was not the case. Uh, of course, you need to consider here that there are so many factors to combine and put together. So it seems easy to say, let's do the launch of a new product for Christmas season, but actually you need to coordinate all the departments in your business. And besides this, you may also need to get complementary goods. If we stay as an example in the gaming industry, games are an essential complementary goods. And sometimes what happens is that the gaming uh, devices companies, Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, and so on, they even took over some gaming company ahead of a launch of a new hardware, ahead of a launch of a new gaming console. And this is because they really needed the complementary goods provided by the gaming companies. They needed the games to be embedded, to be included in their gaming library. So all of this must be considered to craft the best um, deployment strategy when entering uh, with your new product in the market. Another thing to consider is whether you would like to optimize your cash flow or whether you would like to or you are willing to accept some degree of cannibalization. Let me give you first a definition of cannibalization. Cannibalization is defined as when a firm sales of one product or the sales of a firm in one location can diminish the sales of another product or of another location of a firm. 
So generally what firms do is they try to avoid to have this overlapping and they prefer instead to have life cycles. So one product life cycle, a new product life cycle, each of them generating their own cash flow, cash flow that will cover the initial investment costs and then uh, eventually as, um, as hoped by the firm to create profits for the firm. However, if you are in industries where increasing return of new technology are at play, we have just seen this, again, this is a typical concept of innovation management, increasing returns relate primarily to strong learning curve and network externalities. Learning curve, how much you learn is more goods you produce, and the network externalities is the value of a technology increases the more people, the more users are adopting that technology. So in this industry where learning curves and network effects are at play, you may need to be bolder and in some cases even go on with cannibalization. Sticking to the gaming industry, some companies, for example, Nintendo, in the late 80s, since they were in a dominant position in the gaming, in the gaming industry, they did not want to disrupt their existing product offerings and thereby newcomers like Sony step into the industry. So in some cases, you need to be bold and you need to cannibalize your products. Another factor to consider is the compatibility with other products. We already discussed in prior video lectures about protection of innovation. So we know that we can protect innovation. Uh, we know that in some cases when we need to speed up the adoption of innovation, we may decide for some lower protection of innovation. In, in this case, uh, there are, of course, some risk. The more we open our innovation, the more other companies can use the technology, the more other companies can drive uh, prices down, and then eventually we might be unable to recoup from our initial investment in a technology. So we always need to make sure that we strike a careful balance between protecting our innovation, but at the same time being able to allow other company to create compatible goods that will foster the adoption of our technology. So essentially, when we define our deployment strategy, we need to consider first how compatible or how incompatible we want to make our technology. For example, if there is already a technology with a very solid install base, so in that case, we may decide to make our new product compatible with this existing install base. For instance, a lot of producers of electronic devices, personal computers, and so on, they made them IBM compatible because they wanted to rely, they wanted to leverage on the install base by IBM. Also, we can see this in, in the gaming industry again, so that uh, many gaming companies, they make the games compatible with more than one gaming console. And by doing so, the library will be so much more um, appealing to consumers. Another thing to consider is not the compatibility, it's not only the compatibility with existing products, but also what we define as backward compatibility, the compatibility with prior products. And again, this is a key type of compatibility in the gaming industry. And here we actually 
So some different stances on this type of compatibility. So <clears throat> Nintendo originally did not want to make their games or compatible games to be used in their new generation of devices. And this is because they thought that by doing so, they would have pushed people to buy the new generation. As a, as, at the opposite, Sony made its gaming console compatible also with prior version of a game. In thereby, they created so much larger library, even from past generation to be used on newer generations. And this, at the end, was a competitive advantage of Sony over Nintendo. We can see the same example when a Blu-ray were introduced. So <clears throat> the devices reading Blu-rays were also able to read DVDs and CD to products from prior generation. It's another example of backward compatibility. However, when you pursue backward compatibility, even though you can give access to so many more options to your customers, at the same time, to an extent, you may look like less forward thinking as an organization. So some companies, besides the example I gave you earlier of Nintendo, some companies decide specifically to avoid this backward compatibility because they want to push, they want to move the industry forward. An example is iPhone, Apple and iPhone. With the iPhone 7, they wanted to abandon the analog headphone and just move to um, headphones uh, without earbuds, without any wires. And they even uh, took out the jack from the iPhone because we really did not want uh, consumers to still use the wide uh, earphones. In uh, Phil Schiller, the marketing chief officer of, of Apple back then, said uh, some people have asked why we would remove the analog headphone jack from the iPhone. And his answer was, it really comes down to one word, courage. The courage to move on, to do something new that betters all of us. So here it's more about the strategy, more about the vision that you would like your company to pursue. This was a controversial choice. Uh, some Apple customers like this philosophy. Some other Apple customers try to find some uh, some connector device that still allowed them to use uh, the analog headphones. So still, you know, this is a, a controversial strategy, but it really depends on the strategic intent in the overall culture, overall direction of your organization. Pricing. Pricing is another important factor to consider because the pricing will affect your positioning, your rate of adoption in your cash flow generation. Pricing is essentially a way to give information. It's the first information you give to our, to your customers. You don't actually just tell them how much is it. You tell them what is the quality. What is the exclusivity of a product? What is the accessibility of a product? Who are your competitors? What do you want to achieve? All of this is embedded in the two numbers or sometimes uh, three or, or, or four digit of a price. So it's a very powerful tool. It's very important for companies to manage this carefully. And thereby, companies need first to identify their pricing objectives. Survival pricing. This could be an objective of a company. Survival pricing is essentially the type of price that you set 
to cover your investment and cost. So this is generally um, not really um, a long lasting type of position, but if you are defending your market share, you may want to go for this option. The other two options could be that to, you would like to be a little more like short term oriented. So you would like to maximize your current profits and thereby you set higher price, which enables you also to basically get the return on the investment of a new innovation. Some other cases, again, these would be for industries uh, characterized by increasing returns on innovation. You may want to maximize your uh, market shares. Generally, for innovative uh, products, you will adopt a market scheming strategy, which means at the beginning you will charge high initial prices. This is also a way to signal to the market that you are introducing high technology, high valuable product, and uh, consequently uh, you want to make your customers aware of this. And then this will be followed by a more of a penetration price, which means that then uh, later on you will decrease the price because you want to increase your uh, market share. So this is a good pricing strategy. At the same time, you are calling on new competitors to come into the industry uh, because they see the industry to be attractive. Another way to do is since the beginning to start with a penetration price. So instead of like setting first high price and then later on a penetration price, you start since the beginning with a penetration strike price. This is specifically for the industries where you need to achieve as fast as possible a large user group. So, of course, when you have a penetration price, you increase the adoption, you draw up a volume, you may reach the economy of scale uh, faster. Uh, at the same time, it's more complicated to get your investment covered. Um, and it could be even, you can even face the risk, but you are not covering your investment. However, if your strategy is to create a dominant design in an industry, to create a new standard in the industry, or just to learn learning curve, especially when you have increasing return on, uh, on your innovation. So you want to learn how to produce that good, so you are fine to give up some profitability just to get better and better and better at producing that good. There are examples of this, even from large companies. For instance, when Honda, the car making company, introduced the first Honda Insight, which was their first hybrid vehicle, they wanted to learn how to make excellent hybrid vehicles. So they set a price of $20,000, which was below the profitability. They never reached break-even point with that car. So you may wonder why did Honda do this? And the reason is that they prioritize the learning curve they wanted to do to get better at making these cars. And also they wanted to brand Honda as a company moving forward, creating green vehicles and so on. And then later on, after like two, three years of this strategy, finally, um, they started also to, to reach break-even point with the Honda Insight. You also need to consider that uh, when you are setting the price to an extent, you may change the perception of customers. So, <clears throat> for example, when you give a free trial or introductory pricing, which is very low, the reason is that according to Roger's theory of adoption, you want people to try. But at the same time, 
then people may feel that your product is not so valuable. So this is something again that you need to carefully consider because it could be could be challenging. In some cases, when there are many complementary goods, so you can also decide that your uh, one of your goods, like the architectural goods, will be sold at a low price, and the complementary goods will be sold at a higher price. This is the so-called razor and blade strategy coming from uh, the razors that are cheap and the blades that are not. Another example, especially in software as a service, is the freemium model. So with the basic version being free and a version with some additional features uh, like the pro version and so on that need a customer to pay a fee for this. Again, there is no one right pricing strategy for every innovation, but we have some insights, we have studies, we have data showing that if freemium model on one hand drive the adoption of innovation because enables people to try out innovations, on the other hand, when people get things for free, then they are less likely to really maximize their experience or to buy add on and so on. So an example coming from Steam, the gaming <clears throat> platform. So uh, there are researches which show that people that paid for games on Steam, so then they were also more likely to pay for add on or to pay in their games. But the one who just used like free games, they didn't do this. The landmark example of a freemium strategy, because was really, really successful, is probably Dropbox. A Dropbox was kind of like a typical use case of a freemium strategy. Uh, the reason why they did this is because they couldn't grow their user base through Google AdWords and digital marketing enough, and so they adopted uh, the freemium strategy. Uh, they also added a very interesting feature in their freemium strategy, which uh, was a referral program. So people referring the Dropbox, they got some uh, additional incentives and this was very successful. Besides pricing, we also need to consider uh, two more things. One is the distribution system and the other one is a more of a marketing strategy. About the distribution system, what we need to consider first is whether we would like to sell directly. And this will give us more control over the process, the price, and the service. It's kind of difficult. It will require to hire people, it will require to have um, showrooms, and so on. So generally, companies shy away from this option. But there are also companies that intentionally adopt this, especially when they are aware that the innovation is so new that if they don't do this, actually they might struggle to sell their products. Case in point for selling directly is Tesla. They didn't want to go through traditional dealers, car dealers, because traditional car dealers were selling traditional cars, this was not a good option for Tesla. Consequently, they decided to go directly to have some shops in a high traffic location, plus online assistance service and so on. So completely different approach, but it was due to the uniqueness of their product. Other ways to do would be through representative of manufacturers, so these are like agents uh, that will promote uh, the product lines of one or more than one manufacturer, or go through wholesalers, so wholesalers will buy in bulk, so big quantity, and then resell them, and generally they will resell to retailers. Retailers are all the firms that sell to the public, um, could be from uh, from a dealership in the car industry to a supermarket uh, in in food and beverage, uh, groceries, 
and so on. Uh, we also need to consider the case of original equipment manufacturer who can also be defined as value added resellers who are the original equipment manufacturer. So the original equipment manufacturers buy the products from other manufacturers and then they assemble them or in some cases they customize them and then they will sell these products under the OEM, which is the abbreviation for original equipment manufacturers. So they will sell this under their own name. A very interesting point is that recently we have seen the role of technology coming in, in every business. And there is a misperception that now there are no middlemen or that there are fewer middlemen, which is not actually true. It's true that there is more connection between brands, between producers and end users. This is true. But there is still a lot of intermediation. But this is a different type of intermediation. So there is there are still a lot of companies that do, for example, in the e-commerce space that we do the fulfillment. So companies that maybe are not so well known or services that are not so well known, but still all of this is embedded in the overall value chain. So it's not so true that there is only a disintermediation, but we can actually say that there is more of a reconfiguration. Think of grocery shopping. If you do online grocery shopping, there will be some fulfillment service. Could be a third party logistic provider, could be someone from the shop that will accomplish that last mile delivery. But traditionally, this was done by end users. So they were the, it was the end users to go and buy at the shop. So this is an example of reconfiguration what people, consumers used to do before, now it's allocated to other parties. Could be the shop, could be a third party uh, logistic provider. How can you decide what um, providers, what distribution system, what intermediaries you should rely on? So you can use this uh, three question evaluation assessment so the first one is, how does your product fit with distribution requirement? Do you have already six channels? Can you add in your six channels new products and so on? The second one is how numerous and dispersed are your customer and how much product education or service will they require? Do they need to do some trial? Do you need to do some installation? Do you need to do some customization? For example, in the case of Tesla, the answer here was yes. We are dispersed, but we need education about electric vehicles, how to use electric vehicles, for how long, how to take care of a battery and so on. We needed to try it. We needed some customization, and so that's why Tesla then decided to do this on their own because it was a strategic core part for the success of Tesla. The third criterion that you can analyze is how are competing products or substitute products sold currently in the market because you can make a, a an assessment towards uh, your competitors and also gap analysis of what your company is doing and how your company could enhance the operation to achieve the same level of competitors. If you would like to accelerate the distribution, so there are a few techniques which you can deploy that can help you accelerate with your distribution strategy. So you can forge some alliances with some distributors uh, for example, you can give them exclusivity because you want to push them to sell your products. Uh, you can um, sell products uh, together with other existing products. So this would be to create a bundle of products which can make your uh, proposition more appealing. Uh, you can provide discounts or some other special incentives to some users, to some key users. 
uh, that can uh, drive uh, the distribution of your products. You can also do the so-called consignment. Consignment means that you will stock the goods at your uh, distributor. This is a consignment stock, which means that then the distributor can sell faster instead of receiving the goods from your company to their company. They have already the consignment in their company so they can speed up the distribution in case there is a spike in the demand. We also need to see what are the implications from a marketing perspective when we deploy our innovation strategy. So when we launch a new innovation, our message, advertisement message must be very effective. Uh, we must reach the appropriate uh, market. We must strike a balance again between how our product is new, it's appealing, it's technology advanced, and the information. So we need to impress people, but at the same time, we need to let them understand about the ease of use and the usability. Ease of use and usability are two key concepts of innovation management, which can drive technology adoption. A list of marketing and advertisement media is offered in this slide from online advertisement, social media, television, radio. I will leave this part up to the audience to read. And in this second slide, a list of more traditional mass media is provided. Another essential part of marketing is the promotions. So the tactic that you can use to make your products be more appealing in a short a period of time. For example, could be bonuses that you give to your distributors, can be samples, can be free trials, can be some free products that you give uh, to, to the users and so on. You also need to consider the publicity, the public relation. It's important that when you launch a new product, you cover media that are relevant with your audience. For example, if you are launching some new technology product, you should also consider that coverage from specialized media in the technology field can build up your reputation, your credibility as a technology provider. You can also consider events, roadshow, congress, conferences, white papers, report, reports provided by your company. And again, all of these serve as a way to build up your reputation and your expertise. All these publicity and public relations is so much more important when you are in the technology innovation management area because you need credibility, you need reputation. If you are in fast mover consuming goods, probably you don't need so much of credibility because people will make more of impulse purchases. But when it comes to innovation, especially technology innovation, this is uh, really important. Another phase of publicity and public relation is the so-called viral marketing. So to make your product and your uh, communication strategy viral. In conclusion, one important thing to remember is that, especially at the beginning, you need to address the early adopters. At the beginning of the S-curve of a technology, um, technology development and technology adoption, you need to target the early adopters. Later on, you can target the early majority and then the late majority. Keep in mind each of these groups respond to different marketing campaigns. The early adopters would like to see the superior technical content and that this product is cutting edge. The early majority would like to understand more about the ease of use and the usefulness of a product. In the late majority or laggards, 
they will be mostly impressed by reliability, by simplicity and cost effectiveness. So different groups, different period of time, different messages. This is a uh, typical S curve. So here we can see where we position innovators and early adopters, the cusp, which we already seen in prior uh, video lectures, which means when we move from the early stage to the full commercialization stage, when we enter into a full commercialization stage, we also see an exponential growth in the adoption of a new technology. This is where early majority, late majority and laggards will come in to purchase the new innovation. Marketing is also a good way to shape the perception of your consumers to influence them. So many companies are, especially technology companies, are able to give this idea. Again, if we stay in the gaming industry, some gaming companies are able to convey this message that they are market leader even when they are not. And this is a way to shape the mindset of consumers and to let them perceive that you are even more important than what uh, you, 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 you deem to be. Uh, and also, you need to consider that uh, it's, it's key that uh, through your uh, marketing activities, you are nurturing your reputation and you are making sure that uh, all of your users, not only the early adopters, but also uh, the late adopters, the laggard, are um, aware of your standing in the market. So to conclude on what we studied in this video lecture today. So first, we analyze the deployment strategy to effectively market new innovations in an industry used as a case study, the gaming industry. Then we analyze what are the important factors to consider when we craft our deployment strategies. So we need to consider first the timing of entry. We need to consider the pricing. We need to consider the distribution strategy. And finally, the marketing strategies. In all of these, always in the context of innovation management, meaning in the context of the typical factors, drivers, concept that shape innovation management from increasing return of innovation, basically the, the learning curve effect and network externality, to the, to the adoption of innovation, trialability, observability, ease of use, and so on. So these are the concept typical of innovation management, which we should always be aware of, we should always consider when we craft our deployment strategy. Hope you enjoy this video and I wish you to apply all these uh, paradigms, frameworks, strategies learned throughout this innovation management course and to finally deploy your innovation strategy to successfully launch new products in the market. Thank you for watching. Bye.